Hiya, yeah, just a short one this time, which takes us from ARM64 assembly running on Mac, which we used in the last video, to x86-64 assembly under Linux. I really recommend you don't watch this one without watching the previous one first. I can't stop you, but if you don't watch that one first and anything doesn't make any sense in this video, that might be why. When I was researching ARM64 assembly, somebody said that it wasn't really the best assembly to start learning. And so I went into this video about x86-64, expecting it to be fairly straightforward. Now I like to keep a positive attitude about all the technology I work with, but I will say that x86-64 assembly did test my patience a few times. So here's the positive spin on it x86-64 assembly was designed to be sort of backward compatible going back around 50 years. That's not quite true, but it's the, kind of the spirit. There's a lot of legacy and in each phase of new development, new big ideas were in fashion. So when you're working with x86-64 assembly, you're living all that history at once. The positive side of this is getting to ask questions like, why do syscalls and subroutines have subtly different calling conventions? Are the AX, BX, CX, and DX registers in alphabetical order or not? Which multiplication instruction should I use? And probably there are interesting reasons behind each question that we could spend months or years really investigating and which might teach us more about the field that we've come to love. The negative side of it is that there are a lot of fiddly bits to think about and remember, particularly at the start. And so I would encourage you, and honestly me too, to bring an attitude that you might have towards kind of an annoying friend who you also find very endearing. Like every time x86 confuses you or trips you up, just think like, oh you, it's always something with you. Basically x86 has character. Anyway, once more, this video is only really gonna make sense alongside the last one, so go and watch that one first. Let's start off with me saying, let's get set up. Let's get set up. Here I am logged into an AWS free tier instance. I'm using Ubuntu and the T2 micro instance type, but you can use whatever you like. Just make sure the architecture is 64-bit x86. If your computer is Linux x86 64 locally, then you don't need to do this, of course. I'm cloning the toy x86 64 template I've put together for this video. It's basically just the ARM64 Apple Silicon one, but ported to x86 assembly. You can find the instructions on how to use it in the repository, which is linked on the OIDS website in the description. I'm running make check to make sure everything's set up okay. You'll probably need to apt install clang and LLDB if you're using a fresh Ubuntu install. I don't want to turn this into a Linux AWS sysadmin video, but there are some instructions on the repo and let me know if you get stuck. It comes with some template code that we'll delete for now and start with a blank file just so that we can demonstrate. I'll run make run to see what happens and we get an error since we've got no code. Just like the ARM64 video, I use a global directive to define the entry point. The default for Linux x86 64 is underscore start, not underscore main, so we use that. I write the label and then some code. I'm going to use the mov instruction to put the number decimal 60 into the RAX register. There are a few differences from ARM64 here, and we'll talk more about those, but in short for now, the order you put the arguments is different. There's a dollar sign before immediate numeric values. The names of the registers are different, and they're also prefixed with a percentage symbol. We're writing a program here that will just exit with exit code 77. In this architecture, this involves setting the register RAX to 60, which is the syscall number for exit, and then RDI to exit's only parameter, the code we want to exit with. We then use the syscall instruction to actually call it, which exits the program, and we run it with make run. Just like before, code 77 is an error exit code, so we get error 77. If we change it to zero, we get a successful exit. Having written our first program, let's move on to looking at the registers. When it comes to registers, I'd say that x86 has a bit more complexity than ARM64. There are a bunch of different orderings and little exceptions that I've done my best to reflect in this graph. There's a fair bit of detail and a few different orderings and little exceptions that I've done my best to reflect in this graphic, so bear with me while we go through it. We've got 16 general purpose registers, which you can see in the middle, and I've split these out into flavored and unflavored variants. Flavored general purpose registers sort of have a purpose in mind that some instructions take notice of, but you can mostly use them for whatever, and unflavored, well, they're just whatever all of the time. You can see the flavored registers in the middle here. We've got the calculatory flavored RAX for accumulator, RBX for base, RCX for counter, and RDX for data. Then the more addressy flavored registers, RSI for source index, RDI for destination index, RSP for stack pointer, and RBP for base pointer. RSP is the spiciest general purpose register. It's not really general purpose, its purpose is 
to point to the top of the stack and that's really it, so don't mess with it. The other ones I've termed special are the instruction pointer, which generally points to the next instruction to execute, and the flags register, which contains the usual flags plus a bunch of others. Then there are eight more really general purpose registers, R8 to R15, which are almost entirely general purpose. Actually, after writing the script, I actually come up with a better way to think about these sort of special general purpose registers. Imagine like they're some sort of superhero squad and they've each got like a special power that they can do. They can all like beat up bad guys, like they can all do that stuff, but some of them you definitely wouldn't put up against certain enemies and some of them are especially good at certain things. So they each kind of have their own special ability almost. It's an analogy, not the truth, but it kind of helps me keep track of it. Now, if you're ever, let's say, making a video about the x86 architecture and you want to ask the question, what is the canonical order of the registers? Let me save you some time. Do not think about that question. It's not going to be good for you. Such an order may exist, but it's not actually that helpful. I'll tell you just one thing. If you order these registers by taking the binary value that encodes them in the instructions and ordering those numerically, the first four are AX, CX, DX, and BX. So they're not actually alphabetical. That's kind of just a coincidence, or so they say. Anyway, I'm not going to get drawn into that. All of these registers can be addressed either as 64, 32, 16, or 8-bit chunks, and sometimes the chunk which is the 16 to 9 bits uh, has a name too. The names vary, but with the top four, it's the form in the diagram which goes R-A-X, E-A-X, A-X, A-H, and A-L. We often use registers to pass arguments to subroutines, and when we do this, we have to decide on an order for the return value and then all of the arguments. The order is different to the order in the middle. REX is the return value, then RDI, RSI, RDX, RCX, R8, and R9, which makes up the six arguments. And just to make things extra fun, when making system calls to the operating system kernel, we have a slightly different order. REX still specifies the return value as well as now the system call number. Then as arguments, we've got RDI, RSI, RDX, and then R10, and then R8 and R9 again, making up the six arguments. So RCX is swapped out for R10 in that order. Now, why is that? Well, probably a bunch of reasons, but it's interesting to note that the syscall instruction, which is built into x86 assembly, stores the value of the return address for the system call in RCX and the flags in R11 so that it can restore them for you after the system call is done. So it definitely can't use RCX and R11 for the arguments because those are going to be overwritten. So my question then is why do subroutines use RCX at all and not stick to the syscall ordering, which I haven't managed to find an answer to. So if you happen to know, let me know in the comments. Now, if we add up the registers used in the subroutine and system calls, we get a list of registers which are known as call E owned registers that might be messed with if we call a subroutine or a system call. If we want to keep those values safe when we call something, we need to store them somewhere and restore them afterwards. All the other registers are known as caller-owned, and if a subroutine wants to use them, or if we are a subroutine and we want to use them, we have to store them and return them to the normal state before we return back to our caller. There are also a bunch of other registers I'm not mentioning here. Some are legacy, some are for floating point operations, and there are many other exciting purposes too. The takeaways are we've got 50 15 registers with various purposes which we can mostly but not always use for whatever we like, and then there's the stack pointer, the instruction pointer, and the flags register which really are special purpose. Some of these stay safe when we call subroutines and syscalls, and some don't. So writing raw x86 assembly involves making some careful choices about register use, and you may want to keep this diagram to refer to. I'll put it on the O's website if you want to save it somewhere. Moving on now to the patterns. Largely these are similar to the ARM64 video, so I'm mostly going to just highlight the important differences. Again, if you've not watched the previous video, I definitely recommend watching it before this one and treating this as a companion. We'll also cover the patterns in a slightly different order because some things just really make more sense in light of others. Arithmetic first, and really we're going to focus here on the instruction syntax. In x86 assembly, there are two main dialects, probably with a few variants to them. This is what's known as AT&T or GNU assembler or GAS style assembly. It's the default for Unix systems, so that's why we're using it, and we'll talk more about the other style in a little bit. In AT&T assembly, the source goes on the left and the destination goes on the right. Where there's an immediate or literal value, it typically goes on the left. 
analogous to the source. Morph is used to put values into a register, and add works sort of like you'd expect, but unlike ARM64, it only takes two arguments, which it adds together and then puts the result in the value on the right, the destination argument. This means that you can't use add to add two registers together and then put them in a third destination register. You're always taking two values and then altering the second one. For subtraction, this is the same but it's extra strange because you're actually subtracting the first value from the second value and then storing it in the second. You get used to all this stuff, but it's a little mind boggling at first. With multiplication, as with many instructions, there are a few variants. I'll show you two of them. The mul instruction takes just one argument. Its destination is always RAX. So it takes the argument you give it, multiplies that by RAX, and then stores the result back in RAX. This reflects the AX register's special skill, which is arithmetic. Mul also has the property that it accounts for the possibility that the result will be too big for one register, and so it will use 128 bits when you multiply two 64-bit registers together. It does this by extending the upper part into the register RDX. So if you use Mul, be wary that not only will RAX change, RDX will change as well. Mul has a different behavior if you give it two smaller sub-registers like the 32-bit EAX or 16-bit AX, You'll want to look those up in the reference, but most of the time they mess with some part of RDX. If all of this is kind of annoying, you can also use IMUL. IMUL is for signed numbers, and it can take different numbers of arguments, and each different number of arguments can give you different behavior, but for its two argument form, you can use it for unsigned numbers too. Just make sure you check the reference if you're doing anything unusual. I mentioned earlier that there are two-ish different syntax variants for x86 assembly. The one which is more common in Unix-based systems is the at and syntax we've been looking at, the Intel syntax, which you can see on the right, is more commonly used on Windows, though you can also get Clang to use it too with a special flag. Intel syntax puts arguments in the other order, and it also does away with the prefixes. All of this gets particularly interesting when you're looking at instruction reference material, because you're not really 100% sure whether it's using Intel or at and ordering, so make sure you pay attention to that. Okay, moving on, let's print. This works quite similarly to ARM64. For the right syscall, which on Linux is number one, we put our syscall number one into RAX. We then set the first argument register, RDI, to one, meaning standard out, and the second, which is RSI, to the address of the string. For this, we use the LEA instruction, which stands for load effective address. As a side note, this instruction, LEA, is used for all kinds of hacky arithmetical purposes in x86, so if you see it doing weird stuff, then don't be too surprised. We then set the third argument, RDX, to seven, the length of the string and we trigger the system call with syscall. Next, we call the syscall number 60, which is exit, to exit the program with exit code zero in RDI. So similar pattern to ARM64, but with different registers and instructions. Subroutines are also fairly similar. Instead of B for branching, we have JMP for jumping to an address. We use call to call subroutines and ret to return from them. But unlike ARM64, call and ret use the stack to store return addresses, which means we can call and return multiple times by default, though it isn't demonstrated here. More on this in a future video, and actually I'm really looking forward to it because uh, the more assembly I write, the more I'm really falling in love with the stack as a data structure. Loops are fairly similar too. Here we have a program which prints out the same message 10 times. We use the caller owned R12 to store our counting variable since we know it won't be messed with by anyone else. We use LEA to load the address of the message, set up the length, and then call print. Next, we use the inc or increment instruction to increment R12. This is a neat instruction that just adds one, which we don't have in ARM64. Finally, we have our condition using CMP, just like we saw in the last video, but with a different ordering, and then a conditional jump, JB, for jump if R12 is below 10. This is in contrast to the B.LT we saw in the ARM64 video. I'll also state here that JB only expects unsigned numbers. So it's fine here, but if you're dealing with minus numbers, you want a different conditional jump for that. Then we set up the exit code and unconditionally jump to that. We could also call, but since we won't return, jumping works just fine. Once again, control flow works fairly similarly to ARM64, but instead of BLT, we use JB, and instead of B, we use jump. And here's the full x86 port of the ARM64 version I showed you before. All right, to close this out, this video also has a page on the ODES website. It's essentially a mirror of the previous page with the same sorts of resources and exercises, but appropriate for x86-64 rather than ARM64. In the next video, I'm gonna have some real fun tackling some proper assembly challenges, things that should be really stretching, and then talking you through how they work 
work and how I built them. This should be a nice change after all of the pretty intense detail that we've been covering lately, and especially for me, I'm really looking forward to getting my hands dirty. Looking forward to seeing you there. Have a good week.